For the RAF, the race is on. In less than 20 years, it plans to transform its carbon footprint, drastically cutting its vast emissions to become one of the first net zero air forces in the world. While its aircraft are the focus of this change, the RAF's 36 stations are also undergoing a big transformation, looking at ways to operate in a far more sustainable way. At the forefront is RAF Leeming in North Yorkshire. The Generation Z people who are joining the Air Force today think about the world in an entirely different way. The station commander here is Group Captain Blythe Crawford, a former tornado navigator and a passionate believer in green technology. He's turned Leeming into what the RAF's calling its living lab and set the station the target of being near net zero by 2025. Now that's a very tough challenge when you consider the rest of the country is focused on 2050, the Air Force as a whole is focused on 2040. We're trying to bring all of that forward uh, by 15 years to a date that's only you know, three and a bit years away from now. But you need to have a stretch target if you want to push yourselves to the limits. So we have set ourselves that goal and we're very, very fortunate to have so, some of the country's best academics supporting that endeavour. Tucked away in a warehouse is Leeming's tech hub. With its soft chairs and vibrant decor, it looks more like something from Silicon Valley than your traditional air station. In here, military personnel are working with academics from Newcastle University and a number of tech startups as part of Project Vital, a series of groundbreaking experiments aimed at developing the next generation of green tech. If we come back here in 2025, what's going to be different? So I think um, we have a host of opportunities. Um, there are, are opportunities with, first of all, understanding what our carbon footprint is. So baselining um, our carbon footprint across the station is our first objective. Secondly, looking at carbon capture, because everybody talks about carbon tokens and going and planting a forest. There are other ways to do that, and there are some really ingenious ways of doing that, to take in carbon from the atmosphere and deposit it back into the soil. Uh, I think you'll see a significant change in terms of transport around the station. We're already at 25% uh, electric white fleet. I expect us to be almost at 100% if you came back in 2025. We've also created the MOD's first private 5G network across the station. We talk about digital stations all the time, but you need a digital backbone to be able to do that. And the 5G network we've created gives us an Internet of Things test bed that gives us a download speed of up to 300 megabytes per second right across the entire site. So I can connect anything to anything right across the station. The beauty of that is I can put low power sensors into all of my energy consumption systems, my waste management systems, and then remotely look at the station on a day-to-day -day basis and see real time the energy consumptions across, across the base. Leading Newcastle's team of scientists is German engineer Dr Oliver Heydrich. Project VITAL, the VITAL Living Lab, as it says, is actually a, a lab, laboratory where we are conducting experiments and the Living Lab ethos behind this is that it's user driven. So we're listening to people, we are trying to get involved with the, the base people who are working on the base and living on the base to tell us if they actually are happy to use these technologies. A lot of technologies you will develop over the years are not necessarily being taken up because there's a reluctance by, by Joe Public to pick something up. We don't want to make the same mistakes. So we are involving people from the base to tell us as well, oh actually we don't like these solar panels or we don't like these transport uh, electric cars or we don't like hydrogen cars and then we can adapt to this and these experiments are very much about this we are not just providing uh, doing conducting research that is in the lab in our university at Newcastle but we're doing it actually on the ground in here in situ and that's really groundbreaking that has not happened before one of the other experiments here centers on solar power the problem with traditional panels is their size you need a lot of them to collect enough light Dr Elizabeth Gibson is using nanotechnology to develop a completely new solar panel. It's at least 10 times thinner than, than the uh, thickness of the human hair. Yeah. One so thin it can be painted onto walls and even fabric. So these um, materials that we're looking at are completely printable. So rather than all of the energy that you need to grow um, a crystal of silicon, um, we can just print these um, using roll-to-roll -roll technology, which means that we can produce huge quantities very, very quickly. 
Um, they're very cheap. They're based on uh, a material that's the main component in white paint called titanium dioxide. Right. Um, they're really safe. It has an E number. In fact, it's white food coloring. Um, um, but because titania is, is white, it's transparent, um, it doesn't absorb very much solar light. So we then coat it with a pigment, a dye, um, and that is the part that captures the light. So, so in the lab, we like to put these onto glass because it's very easy for us to pick them up and test them. But we also, um, in our group, we can print them onto um, plastic, onto metal foil, and even we've done some work on fabric as well. So they're really flexible, um, and it doesn't matter what angle the light hits them, they're always generating power. So you could potentially have military uniforms down the line that you're walking around generating your own power. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the key is if we want to really decarbonise, I think we need to use every opportunity to harvest light that's just an, an energy that's all around us. The other untapped energy source they're exploring here is geothermal, the heat stored within the earth. They're using seismic sensors to analyse the rock structure beneath the base, looking for areas that contain hot water, water they could eventually extract and use to heat the buildings here. So geothermal energy is making the most of the natural heat that occurs inside the earth. Uh, we've been exploiting the heat within inside the earth for centuries. Roman baths, warm baths, they're all natural warm waters that have risen to the surface. Uh, and now, as we look to decarbonise heating, we're looking at how can we exploit on a much larger scale than we currently do that heat within the earth. Uh, in the UK, we're not on a... On a active plate boundary, don't have lots of volcanoes, but actually still as you go deeper it gets hotter beneath the ground and the water contained within the rocks beneath the ground also increases in temperature as you go deeper. So what we're going to do here as part of our project is to try developing a new method for imaging beneath the surface of the earth to understand what the potential geothermal resources are in advance by deploying low-cost, lightweight sensors. And that will eventually give you a heat map of Leeming? That's the plan, a heat map of the subsurface. And if you want to run through to the full conclusion, heating accounts for about a third of our emissions in the UK. So if we can decarbonise even a proportion of that using geothermal energy, it's a big step to decarbonising our energy system. Some of the green initiatives at Leeming benefit more than just the planet though. The station has its own micro farm, complete with hens and a polytunnel, where service families can grow their own fruit and veg. As well as being a great sustainable resource, it also provides a tranquil space. And it's this mental health benefit that psychologist Dr Leanne Trick is studying, trying to find out if gardening is actually good for your health. So we ask people to wear a smartwatch um, and that would ping every so often. And then we could ask, when the ping goes, we would ask, how are you feeling? What are you doing? Um, and if they're in the polytunnel, how are you feeling? Um, how are your stress levels? Those sorts of questions. Um, but what's really neat about the smartwatch technology is that we could also, um, as well as subjectively asking people to report how they feel um, in that moment while they're here, we can also take a measure of heart rate. So that's a basic biological measure of stress. So that will allow us to see not only um, what the effects of the polytunnel are on mental health, but also on physical well-being as well. Transport is the other area they're researching at Leeming. This aircraft tug has been converted to run on hydrogen, but in an unconventional way. Hydrogen is interesting because hydrogen will be able to enable us to decarbonise larger vehicles. We've seen from cars and light vans that electric propulsion is good enough so we're going to see lots of electric cars. But when it comes to larger vehicles and vehicles that need a lot of torque, um, the more torque you need, the more batteries you need on board, so therefore hydrogen has a role to play. In vehicles, you either use it in a fuel cell, which then generates electricity and drives the electric motors, a bit like an electric car. But what's unique about what we're doing here is they're actually running hydrogen directly in the engine, so as if it's petrol. And what they've done, they've, they've, they've detuned and done some clever stuff to the engine, so there are no um, harmful emissions coming out of the tailpipe, which when people have experimented with putting hydrogen into engines before, that's been an issue. So that's the really unique thing here. So what could a station commander of the future do with all the information that's being gathered here? You were telling me about your augmented reality down the line. You would, I mean, explain that to me, what you, what you would hope to be able to do in, in a few right. years' time. So here's my nirvana. Um, what I want to be able to do is put on a set of augmented reality goggles, look at a bird table, a 3D map of the station, be able to pick up a building in my augmented reality world, 
look at the carbon footprint of that building, the energy usage of that building, um, and control it even from the augmented reality world and control and manage the carbon footprint and energy consumptions of the station um, remotely. We're very fortunate here, we've got some drones. Um, they've been 3D mapping the station since January. We've done that both in the visual spectrum and the IR spectrum, which allows us to see where our buildings are leaking heat, for example, because actually solving your carbon footprint and solving some of your sustainability challenges might be as simple as insulating your building properly. Group Captain Crawford has since moved on from Leeming and been promoted to Air Commodore, but he hands over a station at the very forefront of the RAF's drive to cut its carbon emissions, an incubator for concepts and ideas that could one day leave this living lab and be part of our everyday lives. Simon Newton, Forces News, RAF Leeming. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel.